the realist aesthetic made it to parts of the world that weren't even engaged in the same social dynamics as Europe, but were experiencing a similar urbanization and uh, dislocation of traditional ways. The, uh, the world was growing up in the late 1800s and early 1900s and people were being uh, shifted out of ways of life that they had known for uh, centuries. The, uh, the economic opportunities helped flood the cities with, uh, with people from the countryside who were seeking, uh, seeking work. At the same time, not everybody could find work. So there was a significant rise in the rate of poverty and people who have no skills but could find work on a uh, on a farm perhaps in that economy as the agricultural economy starts to uh, refine itself and, and develop uh, scientific expertise and specialization you don't need as many workers. A lot of these workers find their way to the cities. They have no skills. They're easily exploited. And some of them do all right. Some of them, not so much. There's always going to be a little bit of a fall off. A rising, rising tide doesn't necessarily lift all boats. This happens in every industrialized country um, across the world. So if people could practice realism uh, as, a, as an aesthetic uh, in a conscious way, they were also attentive writers who maybe had only very limited or no, no exposure at all to <clears throat> the art of the realistic movement, <clears throat> excuse me, they would still understand the basic dynamics of it as they look around and see that, okay, if they're observing their world at all, they're seeing that changes are happening and people are suffering and good artists stay attuned to that. And we find that in uh, Higuchi Ichiyo in Japan, a young woman, she, uh, she died at I think uh, 26 or so. She was very young. Uh, she only had a couple of years of productivity, but she actually had some, some real success. She became uh, quite popular, even for, for a brief time. Part of what made her popular is the fact that she was writing about realist themes of poverty and urban settings and uh, desperation that traditionally, you know, nice, polite, uh, Japanese literature didn't address so much but was beginning to more and more but she grew up in it she grew up very poor so she wasn't just doing realism she lived a lot of this stuff and she was just writing from her own experience and that uh, that sense of uh, tangible experience of verisimilitude gave her the clout to be able to really explore different themes that for other people were just themes but for her was the lived experience that she knew it helped her it, it fueled her art but also it probably killed her because she died of tuberculosis at a very young age after probably contacting contracting it in uh by living in squalor for her entire life essentially up until the very end but in the story we have here separate ways we have a uh, a really interesting little pivot point in terms of somebody who grew up practicing realism with some exposure uh, to European traditions uh, and, and she was just the right person in the right time for to import that and popularize it in Japan at the time. But also in certain ways you can see her tilting a little bit towards a kind of modernism. She isn't just staying within the neat, simple, realist box. She is very organically in her own way reaching out into more uh, nuanced, complicated realms 
that in the 20th century would become the, uh, the primary mode, let's say. Uh, Separate Ways itself as a story is, uh, it, it, it has the urban setting, it has the, uh, the, the tale of poverty, um, it's, the, it's a simple story of uh, a young girl who's struggling to get by, but she's a decent girl, she's very nice, and there's a little ragamuffin boy who uh, is an orphan, and uh, he, he sort of, he, they become friends, and he stops by her house, or her apartment, or whatever, uh, on a fairly regular basis, you get the sense he'll just, you know, help himself to a few snacks when he's there. Um, it's, uh, it's very obvious that they see one another as a kind of family and perhaps even more than that. The boy is probably in that pubescent age when, uh, writers love to have adolescents just, you know, starting to realize the ways of the world, uh, at that stage. And this little boy is very much in that, um, he is Kichizo, uh, the girl is Okyo and they have this uh, interesting little dynamic and it's it's a story of disillusionment the common realist theme um, economic strife is a is an element as I said uh, there are uh, interwoven themes of uh, or conflicts of, uh, of class uh, she is from she has parents she isn't necessary she is not wealthy by any means but she at least has in in Kachizo's mind at one point he says you're from a good family and he very much envies that he uh, he keeps identifying himself as her brother and calling her his sister um, and, and and he fixates on that it comes up repeatedly subtly but repeatedly where he understands that he is the lowest of uh, the social strata. Um, uh, he is also, uh, there is a certain gender dynamic here. Uh, there are off-screen men who take advantage of Okio. There, uh, there is a certain assertiveness in Kichizo as he is becoming a man and he seems to want to control uh, Okio, and there's a little bit of a dynamic there that I see based in gender. So again, sort of a uh, social determinist uh, um, uh, faction there. Uh, Kichizo is also repeatedly identified or called Mak as dwarf. Uh, he is apparently rather short, or at least shorter than the average. Uh, for an 11 year old Japanese uh, boy he's shorter than uh, than he should be and he is constantly mocked for this in a very conspicuous and quite heartless way uh, which you know if you want to if you want to go uh, realist uh, social persecution uh, you can you can go uh, in that direction and see well he he is he is uh, more, he is not only the lowest on the economic strata, he is, uh, he is also, you know, sort of an outcast as uh, physically. He has a, a, a deformity of sorts. Um, the, throughout, you have this social determinism, however, where these characters are sort of functioning within that. But it's more subtle than that. Uh, part of what makes it so interesting is that uh, Iguchi Ichiyo moves within that narrow realm and doesn't let herself get boxed in. Uh, she makes Okyo a, uh, for being a, a very, uh, for being fairly, very poor herself very desperate in her own way she makes her a model of at the beginning traditional values she is constantly uh, spouting um, uh, little uh, little proverbs uh, you know uh, he who wears another's clothes will never get anywhere in life she she just responds to uh, uh, she, she's constantly advising 
Kichizo in, with these little bromides that you can tell have just been handed down through generations. She has a family. She would have heard a lot of these. So she has that sense of social continuity. Uh, she, uh, she, is, she is painted as just a lovely girl. Uh, the first image we get her is a Okio, a stylish woman in her early 20s, put her sewing down and hurried to the front door. Her abundant hair was tied back simply. She was too busy to fuss with it. So you get the sense of a very, um, very level-headed girl. Uh, she's getting up because uh, Kichizo has stopped by unexpectedly and like, oh, okay, you're coming in. So she is going to go and uh, welcome him into her into her little home. He kind of bursts in anyway. Uh, but she was working. She's always working. And she uh, she puts that aside to make her uh, her friend feel welcome. And you can see how she is the uh, the constant voice of good manners, of tradition, of uh, basic decency in the social sense. Um, by the end of the story, however, this gets subverted. So you see that it's all rather hypocritical. She she tosses aside traditional values of decency, let's say, and exposes herself as just as caught in the same uh, oppressive system, the same uh, restrictive society as everybody else. And whether you are a good little girl who remembers all of everything that her grandmother ever told her or not, this is a sense of uh, betrayal by society. It takes a good girl and trashes her. Um, she is a, uh, she is, you get the sense, his only friend. Kichizo is mocked by everybody else. He's uh, he's 11 years old. He's working. He oils umbrellas uh, in umbrella repair and manufacture. Um, so he, he doesn't go to school or anything like that. He's just a little street ragamuffin. Um, if this were a uh, if, if this were a Broadway show, he would probably be a newsie. Uh, he, he's just a working child who is trying to eke out a living. You get the sense that he, he barely makes anything. And he helps himself to, like I said, snacks when he comes by uh, Okio's place. He's like, yeah, you know, you, yeah, you got some rice cakes there. You know, hey, can I have one? And there is the suggestion that, well, maybe he doesn't have any other food. Maybe this is his own only food. But he is still helping himself to her food. And she doesn't have a lot of money either, doesn't have a lot of food to go around probably, but she is very welcoming to him and very helpful to him. And he does, he just, again, he makes himself at home. He exploits her. And he's kind of comfortable with that relationship. And he will, um, There are uh, a there is a dynamic between them where he keeps uh, referencing her as his sister. There is almost that suggestion. Maybe it's me reading into it. There is almost a suggestion that well, maybe there is a deeper meaning there. He is again in the throes of puberty at this point, probably, or at least on the edge of it. And there, you get the sense that, well, maybe his infatuation with this young girl, teenager, a couple of years older than him, but I don't think terribly much. Um, it could be something more than that. There is a gender dynamic there that has a sexual, sexualized element within it. I don't think I'm completely off base with that. Um, I would say it's a jump ball. Uh, I, you know, you can read that into it if you will. At the same time, she is attractive to other men 
and as she is working as a seamstress and trying to eke together a living just to scratch out a life for herself, just to get by, uh, and dreaming of, you know, modest aspirations, but still, you know, hoping for something more. Um, she says, you know, in a very admirable way, I'd like to make something of myself. Uh, you know, she wants to pull herself up by her own bootstraps. Again, the belief in the system that would allow that. Uh, it's perhaps naive, it's perhaps inspirational, but you see where she ends up at the end. Part of what makes her uh, uh, so charming, I would say, to Kichizo is that she is very charming. She is very solicitous, she's very helpful, she's a very sweet girl. This can come off also as a little, uh, in certain instances, you get the sense that that um, friendliness can, is ripe for exploitation. Uh, when she, uh, her landlord was an o owner of the umbrella shop, and, and so she was especially cordial to the members of the shop. Bring over your mending any time, boys. I don't care what condition it's in. There are so many people at your house, the mistress won't have time to tend to it. I'm always sewing anyway. One more stitch is nothing. Come and visit me if you have the time. I get lonely living by myself. I like people who speak their minds and that rambunctious Kichizo, he's one of my favorites. Um, maybe it's just me. Again, that, that little, you know, uh, bring your mending over anytime, boys. It sounds almost like a Mae West line. It's a, uh, I get lonely living by myself. She's telling this to a group of older men hanging out together um, with her landlord. There's something a little disquieting about that, something perhaps just harmless flirtation, something that could not be, you know, might not be flirty at all, might just be very earnest. She is, she is dependent on her, on her ability to, uh, to work as a seamstress, and she is saying, hey, if you've got something that needs some, uh, needs some sewing, bring it over, I'm happy to do it. She's always looking for that opportunity. Uh, again, it could be, it could be many, many things. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's touchy. Kichizo is always the outcast. Kichizo is always, uh, in contrast to the, uh, culture. He is mocked, as I said, for his height, for his, uh, somewhat scruffy, dirty, uh, ragamuffin, uh, appearance. Um, he was the butt of all their jokes and the gossip they exchanged over tobacco. Speaking here largely of, uh, other, uh, other men in the, uh, in the little community, probably, uh, the same men that, uh, Okio is perhaps being very solicitous and friendly to. Um, he is always the outcast. He has no purchase into the society. That group of men just sitting around chewing tobacco or smoking tobacco or doing whatever they are with it. Um, he can't access that. He's shut out from it. She, perhaps because she is a pretty young girl who can sew, she has a kind of access, um, or uh, she is open prey to it, depending on how you want to dial in the agency there. Um, in the end, some time goes by, and of course, uh, it comes out that, well, uh, Okio is moving away. Oh, well, Kichizo takes this rather hard. It's like, like where are you going? Uh, th remember, this is, you get the sense, Kichizo's only friend. 
uh, his only steady, uh, reliable meal from time to time. Um, it, it's uh, this is a big disruption in his life, and she is a little uh, iffy on the details. She's not really. She comes up with a story, but it sounds fishy and is very vague. And then it comes out that she is essentially going to be. Um, a kept woman. She is going to be the mistress of another man. An older man, probably. A man with a few dollars. Maybe one of those same men that was standing around with her landlord and with whom she was so friendly. Okio thought that this was a opportunity to work her way up. Okio seems to think that this is her only choice. She can't just keep going, sewing, sewing, sewing all the time. She got a shot and she took it. Kachizo sees this as a betrayal. Kachizo sees this as what? Chizo was always sort of like the little bit of the naughty boy, a little bit of the scamp, and she was always scolding him and giving him all of these little proverbs and bromides and, you know, oh, well, you've got to be, you know, you've got to be honest and upright and all of this stuff. So he was relying on her. He was, Kachizo was exploiting Okio to be his little conscience to whisper in his ear, to keep him on the straight and narrow, to be the family uh, structure he does not have. And she abandons him. And he's hurt. And he's crushed by this. And they have this really nice little back and forth where um, Okio says, towards the end, I won't be able to hear your voice calling anymore. How terrible the world is. And he shoots back, it's not the world, it's you. Whoa. This is where it cracks out of realism. Realism is uh, generally, in the European tradition primarily, but I think we can see it in other traditions, uh, social determinism. You cannot crack out of certain uh, characters, cannot crack out of certain roles within society. They are only cogs in a much larger machine. Uh, here, she seems to be trying to take refuge in that and saying, well, you know, I have no choice. Free will. No, I don't have free will. I am just doing what I have to do to survive, and these are the circumstances that are taking me along. I got caught up. And he's saying, no, you can't hide in that. This is your choice. This is your free will. It's not the world. It's you. Own it. Your oh, immorality is on you. It's not on anybody else. Wow. Right at the end, it's been building to this moment, and it butts up against the limits of the realist framework. And at that point, you start to realize as you look back at how much of this is actually proto modernism. There is, uh, it's largely dialogue driven. You're given very few uh, stage directions or descriptions, as it were. You get nice little details. You point out the bit about the hair not being too fussy because uh, that's really the only detail we get about her physical appearance. We get other people calling him dwarf so we assume, oh okay, he's short, but we don't have any, you know, we're never told and he was only, you know, four foot eleven. Um, we're, we're never given any of that information. We are piecing it all together as fragments from the little bit that we have. And that is almost all 
dialogue driven. This is very modernist. Look at the dialogue itself. There are very few speech tags on it. There's very few he said, she said. I don't know about you. I get into the middle of this and I start reading and one line after the other after the other and pretty soon I have to go, well, now wait a minute, who is who here? And you have to kind of go back and say, oh, okay, there's there's the last one and it says, okay, Okio said. And then the, the next line, which has no speech tag, you can figure, well, okay, since it's only the two of them, it's going to be, that's going to be Kachizo. And then Okio's the one after that, and you count down and down and down and down. And this is great um, if they were taking a writing course or a writing workshop today. Their stuffy little writing professor would probably say, well, no, you have to orient the reader a little bit more. But no. Modernism disorients the reader. Modernism forces the reader to grapple with the uncertainty. And at certain times, you have to ask yourself, why is it so hard to figure out who is, who is speaking at a given moment? Well, maybe because their identities are a little fluid. If you're never sure who is speaking, that's intentional. And you have to think, well, okay, their identities as characters do shift throughout. At the beginning, like we said, Kichizo is kind of the scamp. And <sighs> Okio is always saying, well, okay, no, you have to be right. You have to be respectful. You have to be honest. Work hard and you'll get ahead and do this and do that. And she is the voice of traditional values. The end subverts that entirely. And she is the one who is a little bit on the, uh, the shadier side of conventional morality. And he is the one coming at it from a moralistic point of view and is so outraged that she would do something so uh, unethical in his mind. We're all kind of the same. We're all that mixture. We are all subject to that. We are not fixed identities, but we shift as circumstances may demand. These are the reflections that come from engaging in this sort of reading. These are the, uh, these are the consequences of shifting around as modernism will increasingly do uh, the stability of the reader's perspective uh, the reader may just really want to be oriented the whole time probably does but is that true isn't the reader as vulnerable in the world as everybody else these characters are very vulnerable they are subject to a uh, wild twist of fate. Uh, Kichizo and Okio are just getting buffeted around. That is undeniable. There is an element of agency within that. It's not the world, it's you. But they are still um, victims of a sort. And maybe disturbing the comfortable bourgeois reading experience of seeing, well, okay, what is, what are those poor, poor people doing today? Um, why leave the reader off the hook? Why leave the reader so comfortable in spectatorship? A distinct, a detached perspective why not shift around so that there's some discomfort there we're all subject to the same rules we're all subject to the same social dynamics we're all ultimately vulnerable and in this separate ways uh, Yuji Ichiyo they nail the heart of realism and the whole realist aesthetic mission.